Amen. amen. Well, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Can you say amen? amen? Glory to God. Glory to God. Glad to have you with us this morning. Glory to God. So glad to have part of the Diaz family with us. Amen. I think they're going to have to leave here in a few minutes to go to the airport, but it's good to see you guys. Hallelujah. And uh, glad to have Melissa Farmer with us. Praise God. Amen. Melissa and James, of course, pastor in Colliersville, right outside in Memphis, or really part of Memphis, I guess. And uh, so she's here because, you know, Sandra had a hip replacement last week. They're usually sitting right there, her and Bruce. But uh, amen. Good to see you, Melissa. Always good to see you, baby. We love you. Praise God. And it is so wonderful. You know, I know how it is when you're traveling. You know, you got a lot of things going on. But Melissa, for years and years and years, if she's in the area, she's made a special, even on a Wednesday night, she's come and visited with us here. And it's, it's always been a blessing to us. And we appreciate that, Melissa. We really do. And we are so thankful for you and James and, and the ministry there and the boys and got one getting married, two getting married. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. How many of y'all got now? About 14? Or, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm teasing you. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Can you say amen? amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I, I heard the story of a man and his wife and his mother-in-law. Everybody say mother-in-law. Mother they all went to a, to a visit to Israel together. And so as they were in Israel together, unfortunately, uh, she passed away and so the Israelis, you know, trying to be helpful and to them and so forth, said, well, look, you know, uh, to take her back home, it's going to be $5,000. Then you're still going to have to get with, a, you know, other arrangements. It's going to be many thousands beyond that. And he said, but I'll tell you what, because, you know, America is so good to us and because we understand Christians support us so much. He said, we'll, we'll give you a beautiful, beautiful whole ball of wax for $150 right here in Israel. And so the man thought about it a little bit and he goes, well, I guess we'll ship her back to America. And he said, well, that's going to cost $5,000 and we're, plus, plus, and then we're going to do it for you here for $150. Why, why, would you, why would you possibly do that? And the man said, well, about 2,000 years ago, there was a man buried here in Israel. And after three days, he rose from the dead. And he said, I just can't take that chance. <laughs> Anyway, praise God. Ephesians chapter 2. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Praise God. We talked about grace last week, one aspect about grace. We're going to talk about it from a different viewpoint today. But Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8 says, For by grace you have been saved. Of course, to be saved means, means I really like like this definition, salvation is the sum total of everything that Jesus did for you when he died on the cross. Everything. Not only are we born again and, you know, made, made righteous and get to go to heaven, but we're, we're healed, we're delivered, we're, we're restored, we're helped, we're strengthened. Anything you need in life, God, Jesus is there to give you. Praise God. We're prospered. We're, we're blessed. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. In other words, you didn't earn it, you didn't deserve it. You, it's a gift, it's a gift. If somebody gives you a gift, what do you do? You receive it. That's all you do is you just receive it. Praise God. So by grace you have been saved through faith. Amen. So we saw last week that we are not saved by God's love alone. God loved us, but you see there's this sin problem. And he's a just God. And the wages of sin is death. And without the, without the uh, shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. There is no forgiveness of sins. So God, being a just God, had to deal with our sins. So I like to say it this way. Grace is love that paid a price. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, God loved us and eagerly, eagerly desired to save us. But like I said, our sins had to be dealt with. So he sent Jesus to die on the cross for us in our place, in our stead, so that he could redeem us from our sin nature and from all the curse of the law, praise God, and bless us with every blessing that heaven has to offer. Aren't you glad? So grace is love that paid a price. I call this aspect of grace because there's many aspects of grace, but I call this aspect of grace as, as God's redeeming love. He loved us so much that he sent Jesus, that's redemption, to die on the cross to pay the price so that he could 
grace us and bless us and help us. Amen. Glory to God. And show us kindness throughout the ages to come as you read all of that passage in Ephesians. So all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says our righteousness... Our attempts to be holy before we're saved or even after we're saved, our attempts to be holy are as filthy rags. Filthy rags. Praise God. We always fall short. Apart from Jesus, the Bible says, there is none righteous, no, not one. In other words, not even one person. But thank God we're not apart from Jesus. Can you say amen? Amen. So there is no one right with God. And last Sunday, you know, after the service, Margaret and I went out to eat as we normally do. And so we saw somebody at the restaurant, as, as we, you know, normally do sometimes. And so, and then I've had this experience. This is an interesting experience for me, and, and to give God the glory. But from time to time, I'll sell, pe- see people out on the street, mostly at restaurants. And uh, sometimes it's somebody I hadn't seen in 25 years. Sometimes it's somebody I hadn't seen them 35 years ago. And they'll say, they'll, they'll say, I, I still remember that tape you did. And sometimes I'll remember that tape, and sometimes I won't, won't even remember it. <laughs> I saw a man about three weeks ago. Matter of fact, my, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law was here in town and we went to eat at a restaurant and we saw him and he paid for, he paid for all of our breakfast. But he has come to the church. Now, I don't, I don't know that he ever attended here, maybe visited once or twice with his, with his children, but, but he was never a regular member here. But, but there's a tape that he comes and gets from us on the mine that we did back in the 80s. He got, he got a tape, then 10 years later he came back and got us to redo that tape. Then 10 years later he came back, or 15 years later he came back and we said, well, we don't do tapes anymore, we'll have to make it a CD. And he was like, well, okay. And, and his family told me he has listened to that CD over a hundred times. I finally said, you know, I need to go back and listen to that. And, <laughs> and, and, and so I did, but it, it didn't, you know, I mean, it wasn't for me, but for him, something really resonated and helped him. So we saw somebody, I'll tell you who it was. We saw Regina Heiss last Sunday morning. How many of you remember Regina? She was married to Mr. Mo, Mr. Mo Chapel. Mr. Mo Chapel, when I moved to Cleveland in 1981, shortly thereafter, some of you may not know this, but Mo was from my area. He was from South Georgia. He was from uh, living in Tifton, Georgia at that time. And he came up here to Cleveland with us, praise God. And he married Regina. And then, you know, later they, they, different things happen and so forth. But I, I hadn't seen Regina since the 80s. So Margaret says, there's Regina. So I reached over and I hugged her neck and she hugged my neck. And she, she just blurted this out. She just blurted it out. She said, I remember. I remember when you said this because this made it so easy for me to understand. It made it so clear to me. I remember you saying that the sweetest little grandmother that ever lived on the face of the earth. I mean, we think of our grandmothers, you know, generally speaking, that's a sweet, wonderful person. But, but you said the sweetest little grandmother that has ever lived on the face of the earth, if she doesn't know Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, when she dies, she will not go to heaven. She just burned that out. She said, that really made it simple to me. That, that, I understood that, meaning in essence that you must be born again. Even if you're a sweet little old grandmother and don't have any apparent, <laughs> you know, you're not a drug addict, you're not an alcoholic, you're not a criminal, you're, you're not a whatever. Amen. But you must be born again. And no one is good enough. No one is sweet enough to be saved on their own. We are all sinners before a just and mighty God. And so we can never do anything to earn our salvation. It's all by grace. We just receive by faith what Jesus so freely gave us. Even sweet little old grandmothers. Can you say amen? Amen. So by grace are we saved through faith. Grace is God's part. Faith is our part. But, but, but don't misunderstand that. Grace doesn't make God do anything. Grace just receives what God has already provided. You see, amen? It's like, it's like I said a while ago, when you receive a gift, you just reach out your hand and take it. Faith is your spiritual hand where you take what God gives. You take of the grace of God. Glory to God. So we just simply accept and receive God's grace. And after we are saved, everybody say, after I'm saved. Every good thing that comes to us as Christians is still a matter of grace. After you're saved, every good thing that still comes to your life is a matter of grace. Glory to God. Amen. And our, our ability to, to, to experience God's blessed and our ability to live right is, you know, you don't get saved and all of a sudden you, you say, well, I was saved by grace, but now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, keep the law. I'm going to go back to the law. Some people do that. You know, even Christians, they, they go back to the law and they even, even observe Jewish holidays. You're not a Jew, you dingbat. Excuse me. 
and think that makes them holy. No, those, those laws, those were, you know, or, or what we do is whatever church we happen to go to, we, we put up our own law. On this side is a bunch of do's and on this side is a bunch of don'ts and we decide when we keep the do's and we don't do the don'ts, then we're holy before God. But we have no power to do that in our own ability and strength. We don't put ourselves back under the law because if you could, if you could, if you could have done it on your own, then Jesus didn't die, need to die on the cross. And there's a scripture that actually says that. Amen. So the same grace that saves us blesses us with every spiritual blessing that heaven, heaven has to offer. The same grace that we're justified, let me say it this way, we are both justified and sanctified by the grace of God. In other words, the same grace that saved us uh, makes us and empowers us to live holy and godly lives. We don't do it on our own. We do it by the grace of God. But when it comes to the grace of God in the life of a believer, there are two extremes. Both extremes are wrong. Both extremes are not right. And both extremes will cause you to, to experience harm in your life and, and do you damage. One extreme says, I'm made right with God by faith, but now as a Christian, I got to earn the right to be blessed by Almighty God. I have to earn the right to be used by God by doing good works and living a good, clean, holy life. The other extreme says, because of God's grace, it doesn't matter how I live, doesn't matter what I do, it's all under the blood, and so I just, I don't, you know, there's no responsibilities whatsoever. Well, we want, we want to deal with both of these extremes and then see the truth. Now, what, we may not get to all of this morning, but what, the first one says this, now that I'm a Christian, I must earn the right to be blessed. In other words, if you have a good week and you do enough good things and you're holy enough, then God will bless you. God will use you. God will use you to witness. You know, if you need an answer to prayer, God will give it to you based on your performance of the last two or three weeks. How many of you know that's wrong? <laughs> Amen. But a lot of people feel that way. Glory to God. And so, so I go to church regularly, I read my Bible regularly, I pray, I help other people, I tithe, and because I live such a holy life, you know, then, then God's going to bless me and God's going to use me. But that's not right. And that'll cause you to be extremely frustrated because no one can be justified by their own holy actions and good works. You always come up short of the glory of God, even as a Christian. You have to depend on the grace of God. Amen. And so Paul addressed this in his writings. I'll mention these. They can put them up if they want to. But in Galatians 2.21, Paul said, don't set aside or nullify the grace of God. I do not set aside. Other translations say, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Amen. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. There was no reason for Jesus to die. He suffered the crucifixion. He suffered those stripes on his back. He went through all that hell for no reason whatsoever if you could be right with God and be holy before God because on your own, apart from him. And so he said, don't set aside the grace of God. Don't frustrate the, the grace of God. And if you go back and read the previous verses in context, he's talking specifically about people. He's writing to Christians in the book of Galatia. Galatia is a region. It involves several different churches. So he's writing to these believers, not sinners, but to believers. And, he, and he's telling people who after they are saved, try to achieve spiritual maturity and try to become spiritual and try to be holy and, and earn his blessings by keeping the law. And he says, listen, if you could be made righteous and go on to maturity and deserve the blessings of God by your own holy actions, by, by observances and rituals and ceremonies and uh, obeying some moral code, then Jesus died for no purpose. It, his death was in vain. Because you see, they had this group of people that came back in, in those days. The Bible, the, you know, history calls them Judaizers. They were Jews that said, okay, 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 Jesus. You got to accept Jesus. And you Gentiles, you got to accept. They didn't like Gentiles getting saved. They said, you got to accept Jesus. But now that you're saved, you better go back and obey the Old Testament law and live like a Jew. And Paul said, listen, if, uh, the Old Testament law showed us that we were all sinners desperately in need of a Savior. 
And so Paul was very hard on these people because they were preaching a perverted gospel that hurt people. So he says that in Galatians 2.21. In Galatians 5, I think this is around verses 1, 2, and 3, Matthew there. He says, if, if you as a Christian are trying to stay right with God and earn his blessings based on your ability to be holy, you, look at verse 3 there, Matthew. You are fallen from grace. Glory to God. Maybe the next verse. Yeah, you have fallen from grace. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up going to church, I heard a lot of messages on being fallen from grace. And it usually meant, you backslidden, dirty, rotten Christian, you're out there living in sin, you're out there, you know, doing things you shouldn't be doing, you're fallen from grace. But that's not at all what this scripture is talking about. I see you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Fallen from grace means you're trying to be holy. You're trying to be right with Almighty God. You're trying to earn the blessings of God apart from God's grace. And it cannot be done. You are fallen from grace. You think you're being holy because you dress a certain way and, and you know, go to church on Saturday instead of Sunday and don't wear a ring or whatever your particular denomination tells you that you have to do to be holy. But he says that doesn't make you holy. You're trying to earn God's blessings and trying to be holy apart from Jesus. You're fallen from grace. Well, that's strong, isn't it? Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And then over in uh, Colossians 3, 20 through 23, Paul says, look, you've got to read the whole passage. But Colossians 2, 20 through 23, especially verse 23, I think. Paul says, look, some of you Christians, again, Colossians is written to Christians, not sinners. He said, some of you, through your strict observance of rules and regulations, think that that's making you holy. He says, you observe all kind of man-made rules. And he says, he says you know, you're, you're real strict on yourself and, and you, you know, you, you, you observe these rules and you observe the traditions of men and, and you're trying to, to be so holy in your own power. He says, what you do may look wise, it may look good and it may look religious, but, li but here's what he said. He says, it has absolutely no value at all in helping you overcome the flesh. It has absolutely no power at all in helping you, amen, uh, control uh, your wrong desires. But matter of fact, put that up so people can see it, Matthew. That's Colossians, Colossians 3.23, I believe. Praise God. That's not right. 2.23, 2.23. Praise God. These things, back up and read the verses. Observing certain holy days, keeping man-made rules, traditions of men. You know, these things indeed have the appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, neglect of the body. You're not going to, you're going to control yourself, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Put it up in the Amplified Bible, if you would, Matthew. Praise God, whichever Amplified we have there. Glory to God. These practices indeed have the appearance that popularly passes of wisdom and self-made religion and mock humility and severe treatment of the body, asceticism, but are of no value against sinful of indulgence because they do not honor God. Amen. So let me put it this way. Maybe you'll understand a little bit better. Wearing your hair in a bun and dressing in an unfashionable style does not make you holy nor does it help you control some fleshly desire or some wrong desire. Going to church on Saturday doesn't make you holy, nor does it help you deal with wrong thoughts that come to your mind. Living a life without comforts and criticizing the prosperity message. You know, because everybody has their own definition of, of how much is too much or how much is too little, and why don't you just go with what the word says? Abundant provision, a rich supply, more than enough supply. But, but living a life without comforts or not too much money, even to the point of being a monk, does not make you holy. It does not help you overcome the flesh. It does not help you control wrong thoughts that come to your mind. 
Being even a charismatic Christian and thinking, I don't eat pork, so that makes me holy. That doesn't make you holy, it just means you don't eat pork. And I'm not saying there might be natural reasons, but it has nothing to do with being holy. Not eating certain meats, not eating shrimp. I like shrimp, don't you, Renita? <laughs> Renita is a shrimp eater. Tony said they found a little spot they like in, in, in St. Augustine, Florida, and it's really cool, and it come, you can get nine shrimp or 12 shrimp or 18 shrimp. He said, so the first time they got nine shrimp, and he said, Renita ate her nine, then she ate most of my nine. <laughs> so the next time I got 12 shrimp, and she got 12 shrimp, and she ate her 12, then she ate most of my 12. <laughs> he said, so the last time I went, I got her the 18 shrimp dinner. You're an 18 shrimp dinner woman. I want you to know that. He should have got you that 18 shrimp dinner the first time you went. <laughs> not eating certain meats, not eating shrimp or pork doesn't help you not hate somebody. It doesn't help you not cheat somebody. It doesn't help you not be jealous, not in the least. Even though you are married, you're married, okay. Okay. Thinking that sex is unholy and refraining from it as much as possible does not make you spiritual. As a matter of fact, it means you're disobedient to the word of God. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 7 tells husbands and wives not, not to deprive one another of sexual relations. The women ought to say amen just as much as the men. That's what the word, I'm telling you what the B-I-B-L-E says. It says not to deprive one another from sexual, except for a short time and agreed upon short time so that you might give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And then the word of God says, then come back together again. And actually it says if you'll do this, it helps you not to be tempted by the devil. Glory to God. Amen. I said amen. So people who who withhold, the King James Bible says, do affection, wives and husbands, from their spouse are not spiritual. They're disobedient. They're sinning. Amen. And, and there are other big problems. The other big problem with Christians trying to stay right with God and earn his blessings and overcome sin in their own strength, their own power, their own ability, their own holy living efforts leads to tremendous frustration, self-condemnation, and guilt. Because even as a Christian, you cannot do it in your own power, in your own strength, and you will always come up feeling like a loser. You will always come, in up, come, come up short. You always feel like, I, I just can't live it. I just can't make it. I'm not, not holy enough. Because you're not in yourself. You can never be holy and spiritual enough and deserving enough to experience the blessings of God apart from God's grace. And when you try to do it and you, you continually fail, even though you're a Christian because you're trying to do it in your might and your power instead of just accepting his grace and power, you, that, that person struggles to believe God really loves them because they think, oh no, I wasn't good enough. I'm not perfect enough. I'm not living holy enough. God couldn't use me. God couldn't bless me. God couldn't help me. And, and that leads to tremendous frustration. And you see people like this and they continually beg God to forgive them and God's going, Jesus already died. I already forgave you. They come to the altar service after service after service after server and, and ask for God to forgive them. You know, because they're, they're, because they're thinking wrong. And sometimes they just throw up their hands and say it's useless. I, I can't live this life. It's impossible to live this life. I'm, I might as well just give up and quit. I'm not good enough. Again, if you could do it on your own, apart from God's help and strength and grace, then Jesus died in vain. I like, I, I've mentioned this story before, but you know, Brother Hagin, this, this is longer than this, but it's short in this little story, in this story form. He talks about a Methodist minister, and he's quoting the message. Now, this, this is the Methodist minister. This is, this is a direct quote from him, you know, because, because Brother Hagin says, when we were born again, we died to our old nature. We died to our diseases, and we rose in the fullness of life, free from sins and diseases. And so I was reading a sermon by a Methodist minister once. In his sermon, he shared the following story. I was in bondage to tobacco. I was in a large city at a Methodist conference and wanted a cigarette, Methodist pastor. So I went into the back alley and smoked a cigarette. 
If any of the brethren had seen him, they would have taken his ordination papers away because in those days, you, you know. Afterwards, I felt so condemned. That's the problem. I felt so condemned. I said to the Lord, Lord, I've done my best. I know that I don't need that and I shouldn't be bound by anything and yet I'm under bondage. I've prayed and fasted and tried and prayed and fasted sometimes as long as two weeks and I still go right back to it. Then I heard the Lord say, that's the problem. You've tried to do it yourself. Don't you know I delivered you from all bondage at Calvary? And that came as a revelation to the man. He said, that's right, Lord, you did it. You did it. I don't have to do it. You already do it. I just thank you now that I am delivered. And the man, the, the power of nicotine was broken over his life from that day forward. Can you say amen? amen. So we, we know that we can't save ourselves apart from Jesus, but neither can we earn God's blessings after we're saved. Nor can we live holy lives apart from his help. Nor can we live a truly spiritual life apart from God's grace. Glory to God. Now here's something, here's something. I want you to get this now, very important. We said to you last week, you know, grace, has, grace is multifaceted. You can't, just, you can't just come up with one little one-liner as a definition of grace. It's just too big. You've got to give 14 paragraphs, 14 pages, you know. And so grace is God's undeserved, unmerited, unearned favor. Grace is God's redeeming, redeeming love. But grace oh, is also God's ability and enabling power at work in your life. I'll say that again. Grace is God's ability and enabling power at work in your life. Grace is the ability of God coming on you to do what you can't do for yourself. I said, grace is God's ability, God's power coming on you to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Ephesians 2, 8, let's plug this in. For by grace are you saved through faith. For by God's redeeming love and unearned, undeserved favor and ability and power to do for you what you cannot do for yourself, you are saved through faith. Hallelujah. And that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. So after you're saved, the key, because you should, you should, you know, uh, you know righteous people should outwardly manifest true holiness. Not man-made junk and stupidity, but true spiritual people should live a holy life. But after you're saved, the key to living a victorious, truly spiritual and holy and overcoming life is to operate in God's grace, hallelujah, which you receive by faith. Watch this. If I helped three little ladies cross the street last week, I mean, since last Sunday, I helped three little ladies cross the street, you know, three little children get across the street. You know, when I was a Boy Scout, I gave them back my Eagle badge because I said, you can have your wokeness, and I'm not proud of you anymore. But anyway, when I was a Boy Scout, we had a motto, we had this, but our slogan was, do a good deed daily. I think they say it this way today, do a good turn daily. Do a good deed daily. You know, the motto was, be prepared. The slogan was, do a good deed daily. So if I helped three little old ladies cross the street just last, last week before I got to church here on Sunday, and during that same week, I run into a building burning, and I rescue a child that's in that burning building that would die if I hadn't have rescued them and I live a pretty good moral life, does that mean that I earn the right to be healed? I mean, God doesn't heal me because I rescue babies out of burning buildings. God doesn't heal me because I help little ladies get across the street. God doesn't leave, heal me because I, I did a lot of good stuff last week. God heals me because Jesus already provided healing for me at the cross and I receive that grace by faith. Amen. How about this? So, so I come to church on Sunday morning like I did this morning. I'm coming to church and I say, God, you know, I want to be anointed. You're, you're the word of God said, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen. It's the anointing, the enablement of the spirit. It's the anointing of God, the ability of the spirit. Amen. That breaks the yoke of bondage off people's lives. So, so I, I really need to be anointed. So Father, you know, last week I helped three little ladies across the street and I saved that kid from that burning building and all their parents were, you saw their faces, Father, how happy they were. 
They really love me. Amen. So, so you're going to anoint me because I did that last week, aren't you, Father? I'm going to be very frustrated when I get up to preach because the anointing is not going to be there because I'm trying to base it on something apart from grace. No, the anointing to preach, the anointing to be used by God, the anointing to do the power you need to save you, to heal you, to deliver you, to set you free, to help you overcome something, to help you forgive, to help you overcome some sinful habit, whatever. It's all by grace that you receive by faith. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. So when I, when, I, when I expect God's grace and ask for God's grace, then God's power to heal me. God's power and ability to anoint me. God's, God's power to deliver me. God, God's anointing to help me deal with some problem that I'm to help me, whatever way, comes on me. Glory to God. And that's true in all areas. God's power and ability, God's grace comes on us to do what we cannot do for ourselves when we receive it by faith. So when God says... When the Bible says you can do something, like Caleb said, you've you got to know what the Word of God says. But when the Bible tells you that you can do something, when the Bible says you have something, when the Bible tells you that you are something and you believe it's true and you say it's true and you act like it's true, regardless of how you feel, then grace, God's power and enabling ability comes on you to make it so in your life. Amen. Then and only then. So what should, you, what should you do to experience God's grace? Very specific, very specific. Number one, just, just be willing to, to come to God. Just be willing to turn to God. Well, to turn to God, sometimes you have to turn from some other things. You know, that's what repentance is. Repentance is, repentance is turning from something that's negative and wrong in your life and turning to God. So you have to be you do have to be willing. You see, you have a will. You have to be willing to, to, to let God help you. But, but here's the key. Here's the key. This is so powerful. <laughs> 1 Peter 5, 5 says this. James 4, 16. Proverbs 3, 34 says this. And there's scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture that condemn pride. But here's what, here's what, here's what 1 Peter 5 says. It says, God resists the proud, but gives grace. He gives his ability he gives his power, he gives his enabling power to the humble. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. How many of you need some grace to deal with something in your life? How many of you need more grace? God resists the proud, but he gives power and ability and might and strength and grace to those that humble themselves. So in other words, you say, I cannot do this on my own. When you think you can do it on your own, when you think it's all by your smarts and all by your ability and all by your, I can, I can kick this project and make it work. I can make this family work. I can make this ministry work. I can overcome this sin. I, I, I'm going to be good enough. No, no, no. You have to say, I admit my need. I admit I need help. I acknowledge I need help. I admit my, I need his grace. I need his power. I need his ability. I need his help. Then you receive it. True humility says I cannot, everybody say cannot, really do anything to deserve God's blessings. I just accept what Jesus did to me by faith. True humility says, I can't overcome anything, not really. I can't be effective for God. I can't be used by God in my own power, in my own might, in my own ability, in my own smarts. I just depend totally and completely upon God's power and ability to work in my life. So it says, Lord, I ask you for your power, for your strength, for your ability, for your help in connection with this particular thing that I'm dealing with. It doesn't have to be a sinful thing. It could be in operating this business or, or, or dealing with this child or, or, or you know, my finances. It doesn't, no matter what. Overcoming something that happened to me in the past that should not have happened to me. I need your grace and your ability to help me deal with this. I've been trying to deal with this for 25 years. I never have really gotten over it. I'm going to quit trying and I ask you to enable me with your power and grace. Glory to God. Humility also, everybody say, say, say also. also. 
This is humility. This is humility. I deserve every blessing that God has for me in Christ. Because it's not based on what I did. It's based totally on what he did. As long as you are trying to deserve it, as long as you are trying to be qualified in your own might and strength and ability, you are not being humble. A humble person says, I can't do it. I need God's help. I need God's grace. Glory to God. It's not based on my performance. It's based on what Jesus did for me. Now, are there some things that we should do? Yes, but we do them for We do it because we love God. We do them because when you obey spiritual principles, they produce certain spiritual results. And if you don't do those spiritual results, they don't produce spiritual. If you sow this seed, it'll produce this. If you sow this good seed, it'll produce this good thing. If you sow this wrong seed, it'll sow this wrong seed. But that's, that's, that's part two of this message. True humility receives God's blessings based on what Jesus did, period. Instead of saying, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy, I don't deserve it. It's not based on your performance. It's based on what Jesus did for you. So you have to let God help you. Amen. Because there might be certain areas in your life that you say, well, I'm handling this pretty good. In reality, you can't take your next breath apart from God. <laughs> in reality. But there's going to be some things pop up in your life that you are very aware of. It's really true of all areas because Jesus said, apart from me, thank God we're not apart from him, but apart from me, you can't do nothing. And so we always need to realize that and understand that. We all continually need the grace of power. We need his power and his ability and wisdom to be at work in our lives. He gives grace to the humble. I acknowledge I need that. I admit that I need that. So if you're dealing with, 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 with so this morning, come, come back up, praise team. Come back up, praise team. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. You know, if you went to a Billy Graham crusade at the end of the service, they would give an invitation. We all understand what an invitation is. He preached on you know, you're a sinner, you need Jesus in your life. And he gave, he invited people to come to the altar and get saved. If you go to a Baptist church, they invite people to come to the altar and get saved. If you go to this church or other churches or James, they invite people to come to the altar and get saved. We, we, see, that's what an invitation is. And one of the most famous invitation songs and one of the best invitation songs since Jesus was raised from the dead is a song, Just As I Am. You know, it says, Just As I Am. Now, now listen, listen, listen. Just as I am, without one plea. I don't have anything to bargain with, Lord. There's nothing I've done to deserve this. I don't, I, without one plea, I'm a sinner desperately needing a Savior. I admit that. I humble myself. I recognize that. I admit that. So, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood, see, based on Jesus, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that you bid me come to thee. In other words, God is saying, Jesus already died. He's already raised from the dead. Come, come, come. Just come as you are. Because of based on what Jesus did, not based on what you did. Well, that's a great song for an invitation, isn't it? But you know, I remember hearing Brother Hagin say, he, and I think he did this, Tony, when he used to travel church to church to church back in the you know, 40s and 50s and early 60s. Brother Hagin said, I would have them sing that song sometimes when I prayed for the sick. We're talking to Christians now and we're trying to get Christians healed because I wanted them to come to the altar and, and not come thinking God was gonna heal them because they deserved it. Not coming to the altar thinking that God was gonna heal them based on their performance. See, it used to confuse old time Pentecostals particularly that believed in healing because here's somebody that, that faithfully played the piano every time the doors were open or, or faithfully ushered or faithfully taught in Sunday school and, and, and they wouldn't be healed of some sickness or disease. And here's somebody walk off the street, half backslidden, get right with God, come to the altar, and right there on the spot, bam, healed by the power of God. How come God to heal them? They're not faithful like I am. They're, they're, they're not holy like I am. They're not dedicated like I am. 
Because he's not going to heal you because you're dedicated. And he's not going to heal you because you're faithful. He's going to heal you because you exercise faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because you receive that grace freely. Now, should you do those other things? Yes. But for different reasons. And so, so, so he said, I wanted people to come to the altar just like they came to the altar to be saved and say, I humble myself. I, I, I can't earn this. I, I don't have, I'm not bargaining with you, Lord. I'm just coming to receive what you have freely offered. I'm coming. Bid, I'm bidding you to come, the Lord says. Not based on your performance, not based on your works, but because his blood, because Jesus died on the cross for you. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. So, so whatever you need, listen to me. Listen to me carefully this morning. If you're dealing with a problem of some kind this morning, today, and will humble yourself and ask God for his grace and help in your life, he will give it to you. The gospel of Christ, Romans says, is the power of God unto salvation. Unto all those that please God and really try hard and work in the Sunday school and read their Bible regularly and live a holy life. No, the gospel of Christ is the power of God to save unto all that believe. The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto your salvation, unto all that believe. You have to believe. You have to receive that grace. And so this morning, if you're struggling with something, if you're dealing with something and, and find it hard to, to deal with, if you need God to heal you, see, we're not just talking about, if you need God to heal you, if you need God to, to, to deliver you, if you need God to help you with something and, and free you for something, it could be lust, it could be sickness, it could be fear, it could be depression, it could be anger, it could be some business problem, it could be insecurity, it could be rejection, it could be some oppressive mental thinking, it could be jealousy, it could be alcoholism, it could be tobacco, it, 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 could, it could be struggling with something that happened to you in the past that you just always have a hard time getting over. It, you didn't sin, you didn't do anything wrong, it's just something that, that, that hinders you and bothers you and harms you. It could be unforgiveness. God bids you and invites you to come without one plea, except that his blood was shed for you and freely receive the empowerment of God to overcome the ability of God and the, the power of God will come on you to save you or heal you or enable you to do whatever you need to do. So I want you to stand up with me, praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. God bids you. He invites you to come to him to receive his power and ability and a help to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Just humble yourself and come and expect him to do it based solely on what Jesus did for you, not because you earned it and deserve it. And when we sing this song in the morning, whatever it is, I want you to come. I want you to actually come up front reason I want you to come up front is for two reasons. Number one, it's an act of faith. You're stepping out in faith saying, I expect for the grace of God to meet me at that front. That's a point of contact. When I get to the front, I expect the power of God, the grace of God, the ability of God to come on me and help me with this situation. It's also an act of humility saying, I know I need help. We all need help. We all need help. Every day we all need help. We need grace. We need grace, 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 more grace. But I'm talking about if you're specifically dealing with something and you just want to simply come, this is the gospel. This is where you come in by faith, just receive whatever you need because Jesus already provided it for you based on what he did, not based on what you've done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, that, 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 that may mean forgiveness. See, some people don't forgive them. That may, whatever it is. But as we sing this song, you come, you come. Praise God. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come.
just play, just play. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do in the lives of these people. Glory to God. I, I, I'm up here, Father. I'm not standing there, but I am standing there because there are things that I, I cannot do on my own. I can't do anything on my own, but there are specific things that I'm dealing with that, uh, that I need your grace. I need your help. I need your enabling power. Praise God. Praise God. And so, Father, right now, by faith, by faith, we ask you. Say this. Everybody say this out loud with me. Say, Lord, I ask you for your power, for your strength, for your ability, for your help in this matter. And right now, I receive it by faith. I take it by faith in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Now lift your hands and praise God. Don't go anywhere. Praise your hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God. Glory to God in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. 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 Glory to God in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we agree with these people. We agree with them for the power of God the ability of God and the strength of the Tony In the name of Jesus, praise God. Do, do for him what he cannot do for himself. We receive that strength, that ability. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, praise God. In the name of Jesus, glory to God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, praise God, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, in the name, 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 in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for doing for me what I cannot do for myself. I receive it by faith. I take it by faith. I yield to you. I yield to your spirit right now. Work in me. Work through me. Glory to God in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Without one plea. It's all because of His grace. His grace makes all the difference in your life, praise God. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. We just let God do what He wants to do, praise God. Amen. You want to come pray with somebody? You come pray with them. You feel led to pray with somebody? You come pray with them. Glory to God in the name of Jesus. Yeah, we got you, brother. We got you, Matthew. We got you. In the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. 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 Hey, it's not going to be it's not going to be exactly like you think but it is going to happen it's going to be a little bit of different but you just you just remain faithful you keep walking in the light that you have and good things are headed your way come here baby come here blessings are headed your way you're going to grow your children are going to be but you got to keep you make right decisions Amen. You follow through with those decisions and the grace of God is with you every step of the way. Glory to bless you and to make you a blessing. Pray a little bit different than you think, but you just be patient and wait on the Lord in faith and watch it come to pass. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God. Give him praise, give him praise, give him praise. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb. Of God I 
Somebody says, is it really that, that simple? When I was 10 or 11 years old, I sat at the back of the Baptist church. I knew I needed to go to the altar and get saved. I knew that I needed to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. And they sang this song. And they just didn't sing it one time. They didn't sing it two times. They sang it about five times. And I sat back there and I, I trembled. And finally, I got up enough courage to walk to the front. And when I got to the front, I'm telling you, the, the glory of God hit me, the power of God hit me, the grace of God hit me and did for me what I could never do. The grace of God saved me. And I became a Christian. And, and all my sins were washed away. And my life was eternally changed at that moment simply because I came and received God's grace. And I had to learn after I got saved that I needed to receive God's grace for daily living. Amen. Say that with me. Say, I receive, I receive. As, a as a Christian God's grace, God's, grace. God's, power. God's power, God's ability, God's ability. For, daily for daily living. I depend on Him. I, I trust in Him. Trust and I have it by faith. In Jesus' name. Glory to God. Amen. 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 Glory to God. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> God's grace gives me the ability to do what I cannot do for myself. And there is so much I can't do for myself. I freely admit that because he gives grace to the humble. Amen. I said amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Just as I am with